Wow, hallelujah. Are you hungry for Jesus tonight? Yes. <laughs> That's what I could, oh man. Can I just be honest? You know, I've been in many, many meetings around the world and you walk in and you, you know, you get ready. We come before God. We're not there for man, we're there for the Lord. But I walked in the room tonight, I can feel the fire of the Spirit of God. Can you feel the winds of the Holy Ghost in here? I want you to be honest with me, not just because I'm saying it. I want you to put your hands up. If you have great expectation tonight, if you feel the Lord is here, man, He is really here. I wanna read to you, you can put them down because <laughs> you're about to put them back up again in 30 seconds. <laughs> And if you're watching at home, I really just encourage you to turn any distraction away. Really come with us into the deep places of the Lord tonight. I wanna to read to you Psalm 34, three. It says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. I'm gonna read that to this side. <laughs> oh, magnify the Lord with me. Yes, that's right. Let's try this side. Let's exalt His Name together. Praise the Lord. I sought the Lord and He heard me and He delivered me from all my fears. They looked to Him and they were radiant. Their faces were not ashamed. Oh, taste and see that the Lord, He is good. Tell Him, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's say it again. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good.
Christ is overcome Christ is overcome Sacrifice. Oh, he is the Christ. Yes, he is the Christ. The one who bled and died. Our perfect sacrifice. Yes, he is the Christ. Yes, he is the Christ. The one who bled and died. Perfect sacrifice. Yes, he is the Christ, the one who bled and died, our perfect sacrifice. Yes, he is the Christ, yes, he is the Christ, the one who bled and died, a perfect sacrifice. He is the Christ, he
to my joy to honor you amazing love amazing love how could it be that you my king would die for me amazing love I
just Jesus Cause we want to love you Oh, just Jesus Just Jesus Just Jesus Just Jesus Just Jesus Just Jesus Cause we want to love you
Waiting for you to pass by You place your head over his face So in your presence he wouldn't die
there was something more every voice than the ark of your presence and the manger messiah was born amongst kings and peasants all of israel and all of israel saw the glory and it shines down through the age. Now you called us to poorly seek your face. Make it your prayer now. Show me your face. Show me your face. time David knew David knew there was something more that's beautiful than the ark of your presence ah, the Lord's here in the manger Messiah was born Amongst kings and peasants, all of Israel saw the glory, and it shines down through the age. Now you've called us to pour. voice now show me your face to heaven, lift your hands to heaven. Show me your face, Lord. Your power and your grace. I will make it to the end if I will just see your face. Just one more time. David knew. Let's sing it together. David knew there was something more than the ark of your presence. In a manger, Messiah was born. Amongst kings and peasants, and all of Israel, all of Israel saw the glory, and it shines down through the age. And now you called us to pour.
to the end If I could just see your face Would you just begin to sing in the spirit? Come on. Anointing in the sanctuary, there is a stillness in the atmosphere. Come and lay down the burdens you have carried for. Look at him now. Let's all stand in honor. Every voice.
Can we just lift our hands to the Lord? And from the depths of your being, can you begin thanking Him? It, from the depths of your being, let the Holy Spirit well up inside of you. Begin to thank the Lord for His mercy and His goodness, His kindness. Begin to thank Him for the cross and His precious blood. heaven with eyes closed Holy Father in heaven thank you for inviting us in again tonight to worship you to adore you to love you and we come in the name of Jesus your Holy Son we plead the blood tonight 
Our testimony is of the blood. And so we plead the blood and we enter by the holy blood of the Lamb. We thank you for the blood, Lord. Thank you for every drop, every moment, every second of your passion. Thank you. Come on, just, just, it's got to, it can't be my thanks for you. It's got to be yours. Thank you for your suffering and your love, your beauty. Thank you for bringing us close. Thank you, Jesus, for your spirit. Precious Holy Spirit, fill us again tonight. Fill us, fill this house, fill this property, fill everyone watching around the world. Fill us to overflowing that Jesus would be glorified in us, that we would love him well. receive your glory receive glory tonight all honor all glory all power wisdom riches strength dominion is unto you is unto you O Lord O Lord O Lord of the heavens and the earth all is unto you the name of Jesus is holy can you just put his name on your lips tonight? Jesus. Your name, O oh Lord, is as an ointment poured forth. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. No, no sweeter name. No greater name. Holiest of all. Blessed are you, Lord, forever and ever, forever and ever. Have your way tonight, wonderful Holy Spirit. We are soft and gentle. If we're not, make us that way. Our ears are open. Our hearts are open. Speak to us, O Lord, and touch us for your name's sake. In Jesus' mighty and holy name. Amen. Amen. Can we lift the praise to the Lord? Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed, blessed, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Come on, come on, another one, another one. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Blessed are you, Lord. Oh. <laughs> That felt like five minutes. Don't you love him? Should we, should we break a little more oil on him again? Come on, give him glory. Give him glory. I'll go back to your seat and we're never going to get going here. God bless you. Can we thank the worship team? Thank you, Lord.
Can we welcome Amy tonight as she receives the offering? Love you. You guys thankful to be in the house of the Lord again? This is home. I thought pulling up, I am tired, but it, we get to come worship the King of Kings again. Just a few announcements. So like Jess said this morning, Sunday is Christmas Eve already. And we will be meeting in person on Christmas Eve morning. So that's in the morning. We're gonna gather together and welcome the King. And then Christmas Eve evening, we have pre-recorded a service for you guys. So you can be in your home, celebrate with your family, turn on the TV and, and just worship with us um, in your homes. New Year's Eve is the following Sunday. We will not be meeting in the morning. However, we will have another pre-recorded service for you and we will be meeting Sunday evening, New Year's Eve at nine o'clock and we are gonna ring in the new year worshiping the Lord. So we invite you to come bring your families. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in and receive the offering and I'm gonna read from Matthew chapter six. And this verse has been on my heart all week. Beginning at verse 19, it says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I was at the store this week. Just, just stay with me, I'm going somewhere. I was at the store this week and I was shopping for shoes and I found a great deal on a pair of shoes and I walked out of the store with my really good deal on my pair of shoes and I didn't even get like a foot out the door. And I was like, my heart, leapt inside of me and I was like, I'm gonna go get a pair for each of my girls. And so my great deal didn't turn into such a great deal anymore because I was gonna go buy two more pairs of shoes. But my heart leapt because I was like, I wanna give my girls this gift, this gift that I'm getting a great deal on, but they'll love it so much. I treasure them so much. I wanna see the joy on their faces when I get to give them this gift. And immediately after I thought of that, and my heart was so overwhelmed with joy and love for my daughters, I felt the Holy Spirit say, how much more for me? How much more do you treasure me? That that same joy that you ran back in the store to buy a gift for your girls, would you bring me a gift? Would you bring me a gift that costs something? And so this evening, even as Christmas is approaching and we're so eager to buy the gifts for the ones that we love and it's very easy to be sacrificial in this season, to see the joy on the faces of our friends and family, there is a king, there is a king that is so much more worthy of our gifts. So as we just close our eyes and pray, would you behold the greatest gift that was ever given to us? And would you ask the Holy Spirit, what could you bring him today? What could you bring him this evening? Maybe you brought him something this morning. Maybe you brought him something Thursday and Friday and Saturday, but he's still worthy of our gift today. He's still worthy. So Jesus, we treasure you. We treasure you, Lord. We treasure you, Lord. May we respond again to a king who is worthy. And may we never stop. May we never stop responding. May yesterday's gift never be enough. Because we love you, so we bring our gifts to you today with great love, with great joy. Would you bless everyone in the room? Bless them, Lord, as they give. Bless them, Lord, bless their hands, bless their lives, their ministries, their families, their churches. Lord, we honor you. We honor you with more than just our worship today. We honor you with our resources. In Jesus' name, amen. 
If you're in the room, you can um, text the number on the screen. There are a lot of people in the room today. As you can see, there are a lot of people in the overflow rooms. If you are not able to get through by texting or scanning the code, if there's a code, you can do it the old school way. You can write your card number down on the envelopes that our ushers have. If you, if you need an envelope, just lift your hands. Our ushers will be around to give you those envelopes. Ushers, are you around? Yeah, just lift your hands. You can text the number on the screen if you're watching online. We invite you to give to Jesus this evening as well. And we will be back in just a few moments.
shares of life and rolls of thunder. But I'm not afraid. No, I'm not afraid. Cause I've come to 
we give the Lord praise? Come on, give the Lord praise. Come on, lift the praise to the Lord. Jesus, we give you all the glory. Wow. Can we thank the choir, thank Miss Kathy, thank our team. Your shirt's too tight. <laughs> Cutting off the blood flow. I'm sorry. <laughs> Welcome. Are you guys ready for an amazing night in the presence of the Holy Spirit? We have something very special uh, planned for you all. Tonight we are going to sit and talk. A panel sounds too formal, but to some of you it will feel like a panel. Pastor Benny is here. Can we welcome Pastor Benny? Also, also tonight uh, ministering to us will be Pastor John Kilpatrick. Thank you, Lord. His first time here with us. And I've had the joy of being uh, with Pastor John. And wow, what a leader in the body of Christ and really to the nations. And God entrusted him with a sacred outpouring of the Spirit at Brownsville and pastoring a wonderful church, Church of His Presence in Alabama. I've had the joy of being there. And thank you, Pastor, for making the trip. It means so much. Aren't we honored? Also, yes. Also, tonight, tonight we have Dean Becker, who is the Dean of Divinity at Regent University. He will also be ministering to us. Dean Becker, thank you. Thank you for being here. He is a man uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, mighty in the scriptures. He's been so precious to Jessica and I, and allowed us to study there. It's been such a beautiful, beautiful experience. And for those of you who don't know, there's a beautiful relationship between Jesus' image and Regent. And we're very thankful for that. Many of our students uh, will receive credit hours. And if, should they decide to study further, they'll be able to do that at Regent. And we're honored to partner with you. Pastor Benny's been in great relationship with, uh, with, with the university for years. And so it's exciting to continue this relationship. Thank you so much. Also, Brother Yoon is with us. And... Uh, can we bring that closer, guys? As close as we can. Yeah, let's bring those up. Uh, wow, Brother Yoon, how, how we love him. Uh, I've, I don't think I've met anybody more joyful than, than Brother Yoon. And uh, so tonight, just so you know, we're going to sit. I'm going to lead uh, the discussion. We're going to talk about what it means to follow Jesus, what it truly means to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Unfortunately, uh, there are some, uh, well, perspectives in the body of Christ that uh, are grieving the heart of God, specifically as it pertains to who Jesus is, the role of Holy Scripture. Uh, is Scripture still relevant today? Uh, is the Scripture our ultimate authority? And then what it means to be a disciple. What does it mean to carry your cross and follow the Lord Jesus. It is time that we are clear. It's time that we unapologetically proclaim the word of God. And I, I feel in the depths of my soul that at some point uh, during this, this discussion that the power of the Holy Spirit is going to begin flowing. I have felt that all day. So I'd like to just welcome uh, those who will be ministering to us. Can we please receive them in honor? And I'd like to introduce everyone. Uh, boys, you sit with me. Yeah. Pastor. Pastor here. Yeah. And Dean, Dean, would you sit here, Dean Becker? And Brother Yoon and Isaac, would you come and sit here, please? And Isaac, you'll come with him, huh? Okay. Okay. Shall I bring your suits up now? Yeah, do it now. Do it now. Dear Brother Yoon, come here a second. You can take your seats. I have a big surprise for him tonight. And uh, he's been asking me, he's been asking me for a jacket for like, wait, wait, for four years, for four years. So 
I gave him this one last night. I think that's the one. Yeah, okay. Now, Brother Yoon, listen, listen. I have a big surprise for you. Uh, Lucas, you mind getting them, please? Because I know what he's wanted for a long time. And I just want to see his reaction. Yesterday, he almost took this off of me. <laughs> when I said, I have a, j a jacket for you, he almost pulled it right off. And Ben and I, I said, no, no, I said, that's mine. That's mine, it's okay. <laughs> so, but um, this, this one here, this one here is from Taiwan. This one's from Taiwan. So, but it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. You just leave it here. Uh, this is from Los Angeles. Much better than Taiwan. Okay, it's okay. So I have, I have a surprise oh for you. Surprise for you. Uh, are they bringing it? Yeah, it's in the bag, guys. Okay. Yeah, let's. Uh, Now this, wait, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you. I don't give white suits to a lot of people. You're the second man on earth to be given a white suit from me that I wore in the Crusades, okay? The first man was from Korea, from Dr. Cho's church. You're the next one. So I'd like you to take this uh, cheap jacket off. And, and put this oh very God. expensive one on with oh the Lord. emblem of the Holy Spirit. Okay, because he's wanted, he's wanted a white suit. So, now I don't think my pants will fit you, but you can work on that one. Uh, so, can, can, can you take his jacket off for him? And Lucas, come back here, I need, I need your help. Oh my word. Yeah. Michael is absolutely loving this. Oh, yeah. Okay, so put that down. That's another one for him. C can you take that? Oh, you know what? You're taping it. Okay. Yeah, let's take this thing off like that. It's like homecoming. Yeah, because somebody else. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> Michael, did you just try to speak, did you try to speak Chinese? <laughs> no. Okay. This is very historic. Would somebody hold my mic, please? You can wear it anywhere you want and preach in it. Okay, it's yours. And, and, and the other one is yours. And I even got you, I even got you a new shirt so it would fit, because that red one doesn't match. <laughs> this will match, okay? But for later, for later. Don't wear the shirt now, brother. We, we. We don't have time for that, so you may be seated, and now we can start. Uh, you you want to take this off now? You want to take it off? You want to take it off so you can put it on the hanger? Oh, he wants to keep it on. That's up to him. Okay. Okay. He almost poured oil on my hair last night. He had a horn with him, and he came to put on my head. Oh, no, I said, no, no, no. You can touch me here, but not here. God bless him. Okay, I did it. Well, Dean Becker, what did you think of that?
<laughs> Why don't we pray? Uh, but would you lead us, please? Lord, we thank you for your love. Thank you for the privilege that you've given all of us to serve you and to walk with you. What a privilege, Lord, we all have to be your own, just to know we belong. Thank you for your love. And Lord, I pray you'll touch each one of us tonight and guide our words for your glory and only for your glory, dear Jesus. And the people said, Amen. 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 Pastor John, I think I'd like to start with you. We, we had an amazing uh, but brief conversation in the back about your early days and being mentored and pastored. And uh, what those days were like under the leadership of your pastor, what he taught you, and then it ended with that beautiful encounter, at least regarding the story, you ended by telling me about that life-changing experience that's really held you and kept you for years. Can you talk to the people about your formative days with your pastor, what that looked like to you? Well, I, I came from a broken home. Uh, my father was a um, unbeliever, and when my mother got saved, he began to be vicious. He didn't want a Christian wife. He certainly didn't want a Holy Spirit feel Christian wife. So whenever my mother got saved, she told him she was his fifth wife, and he, she didn't know it. He had two more after her, and I'm his only child out of seven marriages. Wow. <clears throat> so whenever my father turned against us, my mother just told him, she said, Honey, I, I don't want to go to hell, and I don't want my child going to hell and your son. She said... Um, I want to go to church, and I ask you to let us go to church. Well, he did, but he, we had to pay a heavy price for it, my mother. She, my mother used to be abused every Saturday, every Sunday when we'd get home from church. We had to ride the city bus, wow. get off, transfer, get off, walk to church, after church, walk back to the bus stop, transfer, get off at the bus stop at the house, and, and then she'd have to come in and cook for him. And when she started cooking for him, he would light in. He hated Pentecost. He hated tongues. He hated preachers. And so he would set in. And from the time I was, um, the time I was uh, eight years old till twelve, we went through that terrible period. So my mother paid a tremendous price for her son to be in church, a Pentecostal church. She paid a supreme price. My father usually wouldn't stop until he'd draw blood out of her nose or her mouth. Every week? Cussing, every, just about every week. Yeah, just about. Oh cussing and ranting and raving. So finally they divorced. My father left. He left with another woman. My mother, you know, she had to get a job. She only had a third grade education, so she had to get a job scrubbing floors at the nursing home. And so... My pastor, I was called to preach at the age of 14. I was in junior high school. And my pastor came to my mother. And he said, Earl May, would you let me take your boy? And would you let me teach him how to pray? Well, God had called me, how to, God had called me to preach. And it was, a, it was a pretty powerful call. But whenever he said to my mother, would you let me teach him how to pray? I was confused because I knew the Lord called me to preach. And he's talking about prayer. But what he knew that I didn't know is you'll never be successful in the ministry until you're a successful prayer. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn how to pray. So um, I began to go to prayer meetings with him. He had prayer meetings every night. He was older. His family was raised. He would pray every night. And he would wait till the meal shifts got off, like the cotton mills and the foundries. <clears throat> and he would they'd get off about 11 at night. And 11.30, most of them would be gathered. We'd pray with the lights out. There was always enough light in the church to see how to get around, you know. Mm -hmm. But he would lay in the floor from 11.30 every night till 12 o'clock, and he'd tell preacher stories. And he would talk about how people were saved and healed and delivered and, you know, cancer-free. And, uh, you know, it was back in the days of the Depression. He'd tell about his early ministry. And, man, my heart would just burn wow. when I'd hear his stories. 
and I was the youngest one in the group. There was older men there praying. Some nights it was eight, 10 of us there. Some nights it was four of us there, but most nights it was me and pastor alone. Every night, I prayed with them every single night, Sunday through Sunday without missing one night. For how many years? And that's after church on Wednesday night and after church on Sunday. For how many years did this happen? I pastor? prayed with him from the time I was 14 till I got married and went to Bible college. That was about four, four and a half years. Wow. So the thing about it is when I first started praying with him, this is what I wanted to tell everybody. When I first started praying with him, I felt so deprived, you know, because my mother's having to work at night. My dad's gone. My sister had to work. I had nobody at home with me. So pastor said to my mother, will you let me take him and teach him how to pray? Well, I began to go to those prayer meetings with him and I felt so deprived. I felt I just felt so out of, out of place. I didn't feel like I belonged there. He was an old man. Many nights it was just me and him, you know, and it just, it just felt so awkward. But he would teach on prayer. He'd teach us how to pray. He, he didn't just tell us to pray. He'd teach us what prayer was. He'd teach about the different kinds of prayer. He'd say when 12 o'clock came, all right, boys, get the gum out of your mouth. I don't want you standing over in the, in the shadows talking. It's time to pray. I don't want you to pray to impress me. I don't want you to pray to try to impress God. And he would guide us on how to pray, how to get a hold of God and how to pray without being drawing attention to self. So I remember, boy, at first it was tough. And then one night, we were in there, the church, the church had gone through a terrible, terrible thing. The, we was in revival that lasted about five or six weeks with an evangelist. I still remember his name to this day. That evangelist um, was very charismatic, is very powerful, great singer, very handsome, single. And pastor had him come in. Well, when he came in, he just mesmerized so many in the church. Mm. Well, the revival went for about six weeks. Pastor called him in one day, and I remember it. He said, son, I don't know what's wrong, but he said, there's something wrong, and I'm gonna terminate the revival. He said, I can feel it, but I don't know. Well, to make a long story short, he was molesting children. And he actually went to jail, went to prison and served prison time. And the church, the church just split over it. <clears throat> and even after they found out that he was molesting children and that he went to prison, they still never came back to pastor and made things right with pastor because he did the right thing. So the church <clears throat> had just gone down, down, down. It was a bad situation. Uh, we used to run hundreds on Sunday morning. Now we were down to just very few people. And um, we'd always go out and get a bite to eat, you know, before prayer meetings, we'd always go out and get a bite to eat every night, just, to, you know, fellowship. I remember this one particular night, we went out and pastor told us, he said, guys, he said, you know what, I'm going to be leaving. And he said, um, I know that God will send you somebody else along to love you like I have. And whenever I heard that, it broke my heart because I knew that my dad had left me and he became my father. And now he's leaving me. Wow. And so it's like somebody stuck a knife in my gut and twisted the knife. And I just, I got quiet. I couldn't talk. I knew I was going to bust out crying. But he said, I've taken uh, a position at a church in Winter Haven, Florida. And he said, I'm going to be going there. And he said, the Lord will send you guys a good pastor. Well, I knew that nobody's going to come in and take the kind of time with us that he did. He was my mentor, <clears throat> my spiritual father. So we came back to the church that night. And um, sure enough, 11.30 at night, he started praying. He started laying on the floor praying, or, or telling the stories, rather, before we prayed. And while he was telling his stories, um, I was sitting out in the audience. I wouldn't come up front like I always did when he told his stories. I was sitting out in the audience, and I wouldn't even come up front. I, would just, I was in great pain. So I remember it was back during the 60s, and they were having a lot of rioting around our church. It was civil rights marches, and... There was a lot of violence around the church. And so I thought seriously, while he was laying there telling those stories, I said, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch the city bus and I'm gonna go home. Well, first thing, the city bus didn't run on Sunday nights. 
and this was a Sunday night after church. The second thing, I said, well, I'll walk. I couldn't walk, it was too dangerous. So I, I felt trapped. One thing I'd like to say is, many times when you feel trapped, it's a setup from God. God has for you where you are, under the circumstances that you're in, and God is about to show you his glory. So I remember, I had no idea what was about to happen. So as I'm sitting there, and I'm just wanting to leave so bad, and I'm saying under my breath, I'll never come back to church. I'm done. I'm finished. This is too painful. I saw the abuse my mother took. Now this guy's leaving. It's just too painful. I'm not going back to church. I'm done. So if I could have left, I would have left, but I couldn't. I had to wait until the prayer meeting was over, and he always picked me up, and he always carried me home. Wow. So that was my ride. But I didn't know in the next few minutes my life was going to change radically. I'd been praying with him for over a year now. I'm 15 years old. While we're sitting there in the church, I remember the guys would get up and they'd always start praying, you know, just milling around the church in the dark praying. I couldn't, I couldn't get up. And, and pray. I had nothing to pray. I was just dead inside, just empty. And I, I saw one big guy. He walked around a little bit and prayed. And a few minutes, he said, I think I'm going to put on my shoes and go to the house. Well, he bent down to get his shoes, but he never put them on. He just sat back up. And he's sitting on the altar benches. There were altar benches across the front of the church. And um, he just sat back up. And just a few minutes, everybody that in that prayer meeting had quit praying and had walked back up to the front of the church and sitting on the altar benches facing the sanctuary, fa facing the congregation, that, you know. So um, whenever that happened, I saw a pastor get up from the place he always prayed and he came back and he sat down right by me. I, I come up and sit on the altar and he sat down right by me. Well, I knew that those doors were locked five ways. There was pins in the jam at the top pins in the jam at the bottom. There was a dead bolt, a latch, and the doorknob. Wow. They were locked five ways. Pow! A power hit those doors, and they both flew open at the same time. You saw this? Yeah. Wow. They flew open at the same time, but it was 17 I was there that night. Pastor came to Brownsville and told this story with me by his side before he died. And bam, I mean just, the power hit those doors, they opened, and there was just enough force that those metal doorknobs hit that plaster wall. And I can still hear that sound in my head to this day. And in off of that porch, what, one angel? And when he came in that porch, uh, off the porch, he came in the foyer of the church. He turned and he went, and he stood where pastor always prayed. That was his prayer spot. He stood right there. Right in behind him came another one. And he stood in the other corner of the church where I started the church library. And he stood by that big old Rick, Rick, you know, bookcase that we had there. It was always unstable. And that angel stood by the bookcase. What did they look like, Pastor? Well, they had no wings. And they said, ne never said a word. They had no weapons. They were just big men. Whenever I say big men, I mean they were big men. To see something move that big was really... It's fixated in my mind. So I sat there when they came in and one stood there and one stood over here. And whenever I sat there and was seeing those angels, I said to myself, I must never forget this night. So I remember I studied that one and I looked him over good. I studied this one, I looked him over. I remember I pulled my hand up to my face like that and pinched my face to make sure I wasn't dreaming because it felt like a dream. But I knew I wasn't dreaming. And they had just a slight aura of something, like a little power field around them, just slight. And in the dark, you could see it just slight, like an aura. And they stood there for what seemed to be a few minutes, but evidently it was a lot longer. And so after we watched them and after they stood there for a few minutes, they just turned just like a soldier, just like they came in like soldiers. And whenever they left, they stepped out from the back of the wall. They stepped out and they turned just like a soldier, went to the center aisle, turned, and went out the door. And the next one did the same thing. And they left the door open. 
Well, Pastor was sitting by me. Nobody said a word. But I, Pastor was the type of guy, he, was, he had a walk with God that I wish I had. He was a German. His name was R.C. Wetzel. He was a German. Powerful seer. He was a seer and a prophet, but a powerful preacher, mighty powerful preacher. And so whenever they walked out, when the angels walked out, he got right up. You know, he had been used to that kind of activity in his life. And he got right up, and he was walking back there to shut those doors. But when he did, I wasn't going to let him leave me. I just jumped right in behind him. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, I jumped right in behind him, and so did all the rest of us. And when we got back to the foyer where those angels came in, first time I've ever been down in the Spirit, first time I ever felt the power of God, just your legs melted and you went down on the floor and you just went on the floor and could not move. And wow. not only did we go down on the floor, but we went totally out. All 17 and, of you. Huh? Everyone. Just totally out. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, we didn't come awake till the next morning when the sun was coming up through the sun, wow. stained glass windows. And the sun came up in our face, woke us up, and you could hear the traffic going by on 2nd Avenue in front of the church and those doors were still open. And so here's what happened. I'm, I'm going to try to make it as brief as I can. No, here's wonderful. what happened. <laughs> the church was way down. Pastor was leaving. That night, the Holy Spirit spoke to Pastor, and he said, Raymond, I don't want you to leave this church. I want you to stay here and pour in these boys. He said, because I'll use these boys to touch more in their generation than you'll ever touch in yours. Amen. So he stayed. But here's what happened now. The church was down. People had been very abusive to pastor. He shut the revival down of an evangelist they loved. Even though they found out he was in sin, they still was behind him and turned against pastor. Wow. Well, here's what happened. Evidently, the word got out about the angels because on Wednesday night, when everybody gathered for church, the place was jam-packed, jam-packed with people. And it was a normal service until pastor said, bow your heads for the offering. And he just prayed a simple prayer over the offering. 38 people fell out of their seats into the floor and went right through the baptism of the Holy Spirit that could have never received the Holy Spirit before. Just those angels coming in that sanctuary broke the hell off the house. <laughs> broke the hell off the house. They never, they never said a word. They never lifted a finger. And uh, just, they just showed up, and when they showed up, it broke whatever had been loosed in that house. It just broke it off of it, and the church turned around, and it just, it was a powerful, powerful church. Wow. So one of the things I'd like to say is this. Whenever I felt in the early beginnings like I was deprived, the longer I prayed with pastor and the more I saw things happen because of prayer, I'm hooked for life. And I'm going to tell you, God will not send revival unless there's prayer first. Prayer is the premium that you pay for revival. God never puts revival on sale. He never cuts it 50% or 75%. It'll cost this generation what it costs other generations. And I believe that God is now speaking to people around this world to begin to get a hold of God like never before. Uh, Brother Yoon, could you tell us about uh, your time in prison uh, and what the Lord's presence meant to you in prison and what the scriptures meant to you and still mean to you today? Can you talk to us about the value of the word of God and the presence of Jesus while you were in prison and then maybe tell the people how you ended up in prison and for how long? Tianjian 
，就在传福音的时候被抓捕，因此呢，有四次是正规关到监牢里，有超过十年在监狱里离不开神的话。The word of God says, um, um, uh, "Your brother in the suffering in the kingdom." Uh, I'm so honored to to have to, uh, to being a part uh, in this suffering in this kingdom. I went to prison for four times over ten years, and I learned a lot in prison. What do you think this is? 是妈妈那哈认识到主耶稣，我今年是五呃，今年是六十五岁了。呃，我非常感谢神，妈妈没有读过书，但是妈妈带我去了，去看了一个为了一本圣经关过监牢里的一位传道人。他说：“年轻人，你想要圣经，你跪下来，问耶稣要，你哭着要，像小孩子那样哭着要。”有一天，耶稣会把一本圣经送给你。My mom come to Christ through a Norwegian missionary, Mary Monson,、wow. and I was 16 years old. My mom brought me to Christ. My mom didn't know how to write, how to read, but I want more.、Uh, I want more knowledge about Jesus. And my mom, my mom told me, my son, you have to fasting and pray. Uh, the heavenly God will give you a heavenly book, and you can read about the book. And there's a lot of uh, uh, informations about Jesus. So I prayed and fast for 100 days. He fasted、uh, for 100 days. 100 days, and,、uh, and God gave、uh, an old man, an old pastor, a dream about me, and he he took his Bible. Uh, that he buried、uh, during the great persecution in different places, and he found it and put together and brought to me. This was my first Bible. I remember my mother saying to Jesus. I also remember my mother bringing me to see the priest. He was a Chinese Christian who gave him the Bible. I went to look for him. He said, "I have been praying for a long time and have not found the Bible." 他说：“你不要放弃，一直跪下哭着要。有一天，有一天，你记住，这位这位耶稣不但是才能够医治你父亲的癌症，这位耶稣他真的会给你一本圣经。” I still remember the first time、uh, my mom brought me to this man of God. He was very afraid because back at that time, if someone have a Bible, and it means、uh, execution. They kill you if you have a Bible.、Uh, yeah, they will kill. They will kill. Kill them immediately. And、uh, he told me, "Son, I don't have a Bible." And I was crying. I kneel down before him. Said, "Father, please." My mom told me, "You have a Bible. You have the Word of God. I won't read it." Right. And、uh, and he told me, "Go back home and fasting and pray. If this is the will of God, He will give you a Bible." So that one time, I. 因为跪到一个石板上啊，开始跪下祷告睡着的时候，突然之间，我不知道是魂又向外了，或者是一个梦，或者是意象，但是，我看见有一个人拉着一个车向我走来说：“年轻人，你饿吗？”我十五岁的时候，因为哥，因为中国的饥荒，我的哥哥是饿死的。我从小十五岁就是个逃犯的孩子，也没有读过书，只有读三年书。So、um, this man of God just want me, want me、uh, go away, but I took his word in my heart. I start to pray and start to fasting, and、uh, in my house there's a stone table. Every day I kneel on this stone table from the morning to the evening, and I repeat the same word. Wait, wait. How how long did he kneel? Four hundred days. But how long during the day? All day. Tony, you talk about this from from morning to evening. No, not every day. Every day, just every day, just every day, not eat. 
So the whole night I was cry, was crying, uh, kneel down uh, 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 on this uh, uh, stone table, and asking asking God the, the same thing. Lord, I need a Bible. I need a Bible. So after a hundred days, and I had a dream. A man come with a big car full of bread. And this, this man put his hand on my shoulder and asked me, are you hungry? And in the dream, I felt so loved. And I was 16 years old. My older brother died as I was 15 years old. Like 20 to 40 million people in China, they died in the big famine. And uh, nobody was asking me, are you hungry and taking care of me? But in the dream, I saw this man was asking me, are you hungry? Do you want the bread? I immediately start to cry. Yes, I'm hungry. I want to eat this bread. I took this bread, start to eat. Immediately, this bread turned into a Bible. So to finish the story, the next morning, and the Lord sent this sent two young men and uh, uh, a broad this, uh, this older pastor sent two young men. This is the morning after the dream. And they are after the dream, and they, uh, and brought this Bible to me. They knock on. Uh, on, our, on my door, because of this uh, older, pro, uh, older uh, preacher, he got, uh, uh, they got a dream uh, uh, where I live, how I, how I look like, and he sent two young men to me, and they found me and brought me the Bible, New Testament, plus Psalm. And uh, as, as soon as I received this Bible, I kneel down, I start to cry. I, I cry out and by seeing this so is Jesus. The Bible to the door. Yes, uh -huh. this is Jesus, this is my God. So I took this Bible, I start to read, I start to memorizing, and day and night, I'm, even my father spoke to my mom, look, our son got really crazy. Holy,后来,我的,我的父亲就开始说,耶稣给我儿子一本圣经吧,不然他真的会疯啊。那我就说这话的时候,这本圣经就送到我手里。我存,开始被,这个马太福音,我现在还可以被。所以,我就存马太
and God really from fasting. Yeah, uh, answering my prayer. So I start, I took the Bible, I start to memorize the Bible from Matthew all the way uh, to, to Revelation. Wait, so he has the Gospels memorized? Yeah, he, uh, Father memorized all the, the whole the, New Testament. The, the whole New Testament, yeah. And he, he still today, he can still remember the, the four Gospels. Can, can, can you briefly touch on how the scriptures came to you in prison, how the ladies would bring it? Uh with 16, I got a Bible, and with 17, I started to preach the gospel. And uh, three, four years later, I, I was arrested. Um, and uh, until that time, I already memorized the four, four, uh, uh, four gospel, and, uh, and also Acts, Rome. And I, I come into the prison. It was not allowed to, to have a Bible. But I had already the word of God in my spirit. Mm. Hallelujah. Didn't the ladies bring it and didn't they sneak scriptures to him? In, in, didn't people come and sneak the scriptures into the prison? Shengjing,他们就把圣经撕掉,一二一二的,卷开了后,把那个肥皂啊,转到一个,那个,那个,转到一个洞,然后把那圣经卷起来,放到里面。我每一个月都在等待着,他们去的时候,那个肥皂的
。那我现在想讲另外一件事，我有一本圣经，这是呃那个格里汉呐，因为要去拜访中国的时候，后来他给我引着他给我写了一封信，后来被中国政府就把我带上脚镣，带上手铐，关在黑房子里。我那个时候不知道为什么，我就挑战神。我说神呐、啊，你曾经给我一本圣经，我在需要，在监狱里可以判我无期徒刑可以，我需要一本圣经。我就开始绝食，也不吃也不喝。我说神呐、啊，你是神，是你拯救了我。后来我在监狱里面接去祷告，真的是上帝很神奇的。接起那个警察局的局长，呃，省公安厅的这些人呢，最后是也说这个人已经没有办法了，除非给他一本圣经。So there's one more story.、Um, the man of God, Billy Graham, and in the early years he came to China, and、uh, he said to the communist government, "I want, I want to see、uh, Brother Yun." Um, because of this wish、uh, from him, and the Chinese government put me heavily in a high security prison and、uh, tortured me like heavily. They 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 keep asking me, "Who are you?" Even this American preacher won't talk to you, and uh, and uh, and also、uh, Pastor Billy Graham gave me a whole Bible and.、Uh, My word. And that they they took my Bible away and put me in into in in into a hole, so a I couldn't hole? yeah a hole.、Uh-huh. Yeah. So I couldn't stand up. I couldn't lay down. I can just sit there for three months. And、um, I was asking God, so God,、uh, I want my Bible back. <laughs> I start to I start to fasting, and uh, and uh, fighting with God. So God. If you don't give my Bible, I'm going to die right、uh, here in the prison. After 74 days fasting, 74 days in the hall. In the hall and、uh, fasting, and uh, and uh, I was 25 to 30 kilogram. How many pounds is that? I, I, I What? 60 pounds. Wow. No. And. and、uh, After after 74 days, God finally answered my prayer, and、uh, the the boss of the prison he gave me a Bible. The the boss the warden did. Wow, Dean, thank you, brother Yun, thank you. Wow, Dean Becker, you love the scriptures. What comes to your mind as you hear brother Yun? Why do we need? Why do we need the Word of God? You've given so much of your life to the Gospel of Matthew. You and I had a great discussion. Why do we need the Scriptures today? Every revival starts with a hunger for God's Word. Every breakdown in a church starts when we neglect God's holy Word. I'm so deeply taken as I'm sitting here, and. I'm reminded of how the early church would start their services. They would start and proclaim in Latin, "Dominus est," God is here. And in the early church, there was such a deep appreciation for God's word. The training of ministers was so radically different than the way we train ministers at this time. For the first 400 years of the church, this was the test to become a minister. You had to have the ability to memorize and proclaim all four gospels by memory. In the fourth century, this is how Christians used to pray. There's a man called Evagrius Ponticus that would say, he would say. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to pray all hundred and fifty psalms every day from memory. The following leader, John Cassian, that comes after him, says that's too much, and so he says, "I'm going to relax it." He says, "Okay, all hundred and fifty psalms from memory every second day." Wow. 
when I think of John, John the Evangelist, the book of Revelation, and we so often misquote it, we think the book is about the future. The book is about Jesus. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And this man, this book, this knowledge that was given to John was to revive the church during an extraordinarily difficult time. And I'm so amazed every time I read the book. So the book introduces John, and it, it says this. He says, this is the revelation of Jesus given to John. Yeah. And then it goes on and he says, and this John is in Patmos to be a witness of God's word, wow. to be a witness of Jesus Christ, and to show what is to come. We have so many people in the church today that wants to tell the church where to go and what to do, but they are not witnesses to God's word. They have not witnessed Jesus. If you are not a witness to God's word, you cannot witness Christ, which is the supreme truth and treasure in this world. And if we are not witnesses to the word and not witnesses to Christ, dear brothers and sisters, we cannot see anything. It has to start with a deep hunger and thirst for God's word. Uh, David writes in Psalms 19 and he says, the word of God is pure and right and eternal and undiluted and holy. Amen. And there's been, I, I'm listening to Brother Yun and I'm listening to, to my pastor here. And folks, I will say to you, my heart is broken when I think of how we have neglected God's word. Can Last we, thing that I'll sorry, say. Sorry, Dean. Could we just yeah. limit the movement in the yeah. room just for a bit, please? If you could take your seats. Thank you. Yeah. Folks, I will say this to you. Only when we tremble at God's word, can we build him a house. The end of the prophetic book of Isaiah, God asked this question. He says, do you want to build me a house? He says, heaven is my footstool. I have created all of this. He said, but on this one person I will look. The person that have a broken and contrite heart and spirit and get this, and he who trembles at my word. You, Lord. The revival will only come to the church. Renewal will only come to the church if we value God's word again as the word of God. Amen. Could you, we talk, yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Lord. We had a short but beautiful conversation the other day on the phone about our reaction to the Word of God. Our, what, is the, what should the churches or the human reaction be to the gospel? We were talking about repentance, uh, which seems to be in some ways a curse word in the church, unfortunately. Uh, do the scriptures carry the authority to tell us what is wrong, what is right? Do they have the authority to correct us? And is it the mission and the job of a disciple to yield our lives to the Word of God? I could not say it better. And, and folks, let me just start here by saying this. Um, the word disciple is an interesting word, right? In an etymological sense, the word in English, discipline, comes from that word. It is not possible to be a disciple and not be disciplined. Wow. Right. This is of tremendous importance. And this word disciple in Greek is a difficult word to translate. It really, really is. The best, the best definition I've come upon is that a disciple is somebody that spends time with a master to listen, to hear, to watch, to observe, to be transformed, to be disciplined in order to become like him, the master. Now here it is. 
in the Gospel of Mark, which we believe to be the first chronological gospel to be written. It's the heart. And often, people and scholars ignore this gospel. And this gospel is so powerful. And a little bit of background here. The church father said that this gospel was written by John Mark, the disciple of Peter. But that it really represents Peter's preaching. It's mm. Peter's gospel. And Mark tells us that Jesus came down, and here you find the first sermon of Jesus. It's the first recorded sermon of Jesus. And Mark's very, very particular. He said, Jesus came from Galilee to preach the gospel of God. I'm going to stop there for a moment. I think there are many gospels that are being preached today that's not the gospel of God. The gospel of man. The choice today is not between God and the devil, dear brothers and sisters. The choice today is between God and ourselves. Whoa. There's the choice. Which gospel will we believe? And Jesus comes. And it's a one verse, one verse sermon. This sermon is literally just one sentence. And in this sentence we find the purest description of the gospel that you could ever imagine. And so Mark says, Jesus came down to preach the gospel of God. And this is what he said. There are four components. Firstly, he says, the time is now. This is the essence of the gospel. When Christ appears, your time is up. Wow. His time is here. It's not an invitation he arrives on the scene and he says, I am here to rule and reign. Yes. Right? He comes as king. The second thing that Jesus says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Let me retranslate it. King Jesus is here and he is ruling. That's the gospel. And then Jesus says, the only way to respond to these two truths that God is breaking into our time and that Jesus as king has arrived is to repent. Amen. It's the only possible way to respond. And then to believe that all of what Jesus has said, that this is good news. What is the good news? God is breaking into our lives. The king has arrived and we must repent. Repentance is not an addition to the gospel. It is the gospel. Wow. Pastor Benny, can you talk about the value of God's word or whatever the Lord is putting on your heart? I want to follow with Dean Becker. And let's all go just quickly to Isaiah 66, which he brought to us earlier. And I'm so glad, Dean, that you're here and how blessed I am by hearing you tonight. And you had mentioned <clears throat> verse 1 and 2 of Isaiah 66. Thus saith the Lord, the heavens is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye built unto me? What is the place of my rest? For all these things hath mine hand made, and all these things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look even to him that is poor and of a contrite heart, spirit, and trembleth at, at my word. That, I believe, is quite the message I think we're hearing from everyone. And uh, the price you paid, brother, you and the others, very precious what you've endured and you're here to show us the preciousness of scripture. 
you were willing to die for the Lord and all you hungered for was the scriptures and Pastor John how beautifully you put it when you were about to give up it was the Lord who sent those angels it's the scriptures that have kept you all these years and God has used you to bless millions including my own life and now Dean Becker you, you, you are bringing something so profound to all of us and in fact I'd like you to just say a little more on it I just want to say one thing that will help people understand what we just read what God was really saying is heaven is my throne the earth is my footstool what house did you build me here's the house I want I don't want heaven and I don't want earth I want a broken heart that's what I want to dwell am I am I right yeah so what God was saying is I don't want to dwell in, I do not want to dwell in heaven I don't want to dwell on the earth I want to dwell in the heart that is broken wow a poor and humble contrite heart he'll not despise and the first thing the Lord said in Matthew 5 blessed Amen. blessed are the poor in spirit and and I'd like you to kind of take us a little further with that because to my understanding to be in to be poor in spirit means you come to the end of yourself am I right would, would you mind taking that microphone and, and you come to the, to the place where you're completely dependent on the Lord, not on your own life or even trusting your own heart. But then he said something else. And I'd like again to, to look at scripture because I think it's important to tie it together. And let's go to Matthew chapter 5. I was reading it from my Bible and the lights aren't that great here, so I can't see as well. <laughs> All right, but let's just go and read this beautiful portion. So in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then the Lord says something so amazing. Blessed are they that mourn they shall be comforted. I don't believe the Lord was talking about mourning over the loss of loved ones or the loss of finance or the loss of friends. I believe mourning has to do with mourning over our sins. Hmm. Am, I, am I right? Completely. Yeah. So are they both related? They, they, they have to be related. Poor in spirit and mourning are, are in some way connected. Absolutely. Please. Yes. Because when, when, we bec when we come to the end of ourselves, there's only one place to go to, God's Word. Because that's what satisfies the soul. It's more to be, it says in the Psalms, as you were saying in Psalm 19, more to be desired are they than gold. Yet a much fine gold sweeter than the honey and the honeycomb. I would love to hear more from you. I'm tr frankly, I'm really taken by you. Uh, your, your knowledge of history and the history of the church is so, don't, don't you all think so? Aren't you enjoying that? So precious, wow. And I wanna, I wanna hear from you more than I want them to hear me because they, they hear me quite a bit. Quite a bit. Uh, but, but please just take us a little further into poor in spirit and mourning and how does that tie to scripture right pastor benny um i just want to publicly thank you for your extraordinary ministry through the years to me and so i, I feel so honored that i can listen he and was receive with pastor from you Ray Macaulay, um, prior oh you were he's yes, been in your meetings yes. there you're yes. from south africa i am originally from south africa it's not alabama that you're hearing in the background <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I will say that I am accent. from the really deep south. 
And, um, and you worked with, with Ray McCauley? I, I served as uh, the academic dean for the Bible College there oh for goodness. many, many, many years. Well, I used to come back there in the yeah. 70s. And, yeah. I, I know. You just extraordinary, your ministry. Well, thank, thank you. you so sir. kind. So kind. Thank you. So it's interesting when you study the Gospel of Matthew before this incredible sermon, Jesus receives an encounter with God and the Holy Spirit. And you remember as he's baptized, he comes up and the Holy Spirit descends upon him. And he hears this incredible statement from God, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And it models for us what relationship is. But then the Spirit drives him into the wilderness to be tempted. And what are the weapons that he takes into that wilderness? He takes solitude. It's important to spend time alone, uh, alone with God. He takes fasting that Brother Yun spoke about now. But thirdly, he took the Word of God. And he battled with Satan, brothers and sisters, quoting Deuteronomy, the one book nobody reads. That's right. That's the weapon he takes in. Why do you say they, nobody reads? You mean back then or today? No, 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 today. Okay. Back then it was the Torah, the holy word of God. People listened, right? But today, no, nobody really spends time in Deuteronomy. And in this, he quotes this about the word. He says to Satan that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The word of God created all of what we can see. It holds it all together. Job, I was reminded of, of Brother Yun. Job, in the middle of his struggle, said, I have treasured your word more than the food that I need every day. I've treasured it more. But then Jesus climbs a mountain. And that's why the sermon is called the Sermon on the Mount. And before we get to the sermon, we have to see what's going on. Jesus climbs the mountain and it says, and only those that followed him sat down. Not everybody heard this sermon. And then it said, when he got to the mountain, he sat down and he started to teach. And Pastor Benny is so absolutely correct here. Jesus then goes on for three chapters and preach the new law, the new Torah. Not a different one, but the fulfillment of everything that we find within Scripture. Oh, amen. But as he starts to preach, he describes what a blessed person is. The Greek word here, makarios. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to truly be alive? And Pastor Benny, what Jesus does here is that he describes the attributes of a disciple, those that have climbed the mountain. How do you know if you're a disciple? If you're not poor in spirit, if you've not come to the end of yourself, you're not a disciple yet. You're following yourself. Say that again. Yeah. Until you get to the end of yourself, you have not become a disciple. Poverty of spirit is the entrance. It's the first step. Whoa. Well, say it again, dear God, this right. is Bible. Yeah. It's the entrance to... It is the entrance to a life of discipleship. You cannot be a disciple until you've reached poverty of spirit. You mean you cannot live in the spirit without being poor in spirit. Yes, sir. Yes, you sir. can't even find God N till nothing. you reach is, that place. It's the beginning. And, and you just mentioned Job 23. Can you go back to it? Okay, well, well they didn't know which chapter you meant, but uh, let, me, let me just read this to you. I know my Bible. Um, Job begins, can, can, can we just look at it quick? Because I really want, listen, this, this guy's blessing me. And not many people bless me like I'm being blessed right now. You blessed me last night. Dear God, did he not bless us last night? That was heaven, heaven. Job begins by uh, talking about how heavy his troubles were. He said in verse 2, even today is my complaint bitter. 
My stroke is heavier than my groanings. That's a powerful statement. And then he says, I'm looking for God and I cannot find him. Mm. So he starts with saying, I really have a problem. Mm -hmm. And it's heavier than I can carry. Verse 3, oh, that I knew where I might find him. That I might come even to his seat. I'm, I, I want to see God. I want to talk to him. Because I have a problem here. Big, big problem. And if I could find him, he said, I would order my cause before him. I would fill my mouth with, with arguments. And I would know the words which he would answer me. I wish God would just talk to me. Is really what he's saying. I have a big problem. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. I, I, I love to have a meeting with God. I would like to hear what he has to say to me. And then he goes on to say in verse 6, Will he plead against me with his great power? No, he would put strength in me. I need that. But look at something else. Not only is he saying, I wish God would talk to me. I wish I could find him. He says something powerful. In verse 8 he says, Behold, I go forward. He's not there. I go backward. I can't find him. On the left hand, where he's working, I cannot behold him. He's hiding himself on the right hand, and I cannot see him. But then he hits on verse 10. I can't hear him. I cannot talk to him. And I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. In other words, he can see me. That is powerful. And when he says that, he says, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. But he comes to the, the, the solution that we're talking about. He says, I don't have to hear him and I don't have to see him because, because I have esteemed, verse 12, second portion, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Isn't that awesome? Amen. People today are looking for an experience. You'll never find God without his word. Am I, am I hitting on what we're talking about tonight? So people are looking for, well, like, like Job, I wish he talked to me. I wish I can talk to him. I'm carrying this load. I can't, I don't know what to do with myself. I, I can't see him. I'm looking. But he knows the way I take. He's watching over me. And then he hits on the real answer to all troubles. He said, I have esteemed the words of his mouth. Would you mind talking more about that? Because a lot of people today, sadly, are looking for feelings, experience, something, whatever they're looking for. But the Bible, that gives us really all we need. Because in his word we find him. Right. It's really what Job was saying. In his word I find him. In his word I can hear him. Please, Dean, go ahead. Pastor Benny, so extraordinary. So if we look at that Sermon on the Mount, I want to connect it because you said something very insightful there. And so when you look at what Jesus says in the sermon, these are people that have just heard his word. And he describes how do we respond to that. He says poverty of spirit firstly, and you're right. When you see yourself in the light of God's word, how can you not have a broken heart. The Apostle Paul says that godly sorrow drives, literally the Greek says, is the engine of repentance. Right. We have so many churches today where there's almost no godly sorrow any longer. The early Pentecostals knew this. They understood this. But then thirdly, and, and I can go through each of these extraordinary Beatitudes, but the third one says, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek. That word prautes in Greek describes what happens when you take a wild horse and tame it. 
Mm. When we hear the word of God, like Isaiah, who saw God in the temple, and what was his response? Woe is me. Yeah. There's an empty, there's a poverty of spirit that comes. True repentance flows. And then thirdly, and, and, and this is of tremendous importance, there's a taming of our spirits that happen by the holy God. The fourth beatitude is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Hmm. And so there's a process description that happens here, poverty of spirit, true godly mourning, out of this a taming of our spirits that happen, but then fourthly, a deeper desire for God and his word. In the ancient Near East, words mattered. Today, words mean very little. Mm -hmm. But in the ancient world, if you gave your word, that's what Jesus says, that your yes be yes and your no be no. Because a word communicated the very essence of that person. God's word contains all of who he is. Paul makes use of the word theopneustos in Greek when he describes the Bible. And he says the spirit literally resides within the word. Another way to say it is that the words of God drips with his spirit. It is the breath that animates this. The highest way that we can worship God is by receiving his word. Not only is it his breath, but it is his seed. And as the bride. Can you say that again? Yeah. Let's the word of God is not, does not only contain his breath, but it contains, it is his seed. His now, seed. Can, I, can I just yeah, uh, please. ask you something here? Uh, and, and I, because a lot of people may, may understand. Yeah. What now? I, I, I was wondering why you were looking at me. That's all. That's <laughs> uh, I like your beard. Thank Anyways, you. forget it. Uh, no, because this is an important point. That when people ignore the breath. So in Psalm 33 is what you were reading earlier, verse 6. Where it says that the word of the Lord. Let's read that again. It's really what... You know, I'm telling you, saints, what, what this amazing man is saying. And I like, if you don't mind, Pastor John, uh, talk about the influence of the Word and the Spirit in your ministry and life. But it says in verse 6 of Psalm 33, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath. That's what you were saying. Of his mouth. Now, there are people... If I can, can I, can, can I be raw? Is that okay? There are, there, are, there are people who don't know the breath in the scriptures. True. And they become very legalistic. And they condemn us and others who believe in the breath of God. Give us the secret to have both. Would you? Because that's what you just said, and that's what the Bible says. Please, go, 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 go ahead. Absolutely, Pastor Benny. So just to finish that last sentence, the Bible contains the breath of God, firstly. Secondly, it is the seed of God. We are his bride. Wow. The highest way that we can worship our beloved is by receiving his holy seed within us. It's an act of extraordinary intimacy. Now, to come back to Pastor Benny's, in theology, historically, there are three words that we use to describe the Bible. They speak about three moments or three aspects of God working within the word. We firstly say the Bible is inspired. In Latin, inspirare, which means God breathes. 
He breathes into his word. He breathed into people. And as he breathed in, they, this word was produced. But secondly, we use the word inerrant. And that word inerrant means without error. When David writes about the word, the law of God, he says it's undiluted. Think about this. So often people say, well, these are just the words of men. Right, right. No. Which is very popular today. Yeah. yeah. Undiluted from God with no error. The Spirit was present when the Scriptures were written. The Spirit resides within the Scriptures. And then the third word we use is infallible. This is the more extraordinary, powerful. When we say the Bible is infallible, it means it cannot fail. God said this. He says, whatever I have said, whatever I have communicated will not return empty. It will do what I have intended for it to do. So the Holy Spirit was there when the scriptures were produced. The Holy Spirit resides within the text. Folks, let me say to you, this gives me such hope. Uh, here's my hope. Even if I don't understand the scripture, it never changes. Even if I misunderstand it, the truth of God will never change. It's not dependent on me. But when I read the scriptures, the Holy Spirit is present to explain it to us, to teach it to us. And in the words of Jesus, to be our helper, to show us Christ more fully. We can trust in the Holy Word of God because it contains his breath and everything that he is. Dean, can I just say something real quick? So we obviously run a, a ministry school here with students from all over the world and we have a pretty good pulse, I would think, on what is being uh, communicated in much of this generation. We've actually discussed it. What do you say to this thought? I love Jesus, but the Bible is corrupted it is filled with error. I love this person, Jesus, but don't give me the Bible. I mean, recently I've seen worship leaders have actually said, we are preaching too much of the Bible and not giving people Jesus. And from my perspective as a pastor, <laughs> there are many issues in the church. One is not too much Bible reading. So that's my perspective. So how would you answer that, that message? I love Jesus, but not the scripture. I would answer very, very, very firmly and say, you've not met Jesus. That's where we have to start. Um, I, was, I was gonna bring that point that, that my amazing Michael brought up. So we are thinking the same way. Well, he was telling me, and we, we are very troubled. We, I mean, as, as a family, we're very troubled by hearing about preachers and pastors denying scripture. And a few days ago, he was telling me something that was very upsetting to me. Uh, someone I knew who preached right here years ago on his dying, in, uh, he actually passed away. He denied the Bible before he passed away. And it's like, why? How can they? What's going on here? And I'd like, you know, to, to ask Pastor John, because you've, you, you, you've probably seen maybe more than all of us, uh, people come, people go. You've, you've had an amazing move of God uh, in Pensacola. You talked about when you were young that evangelists came and... Uh, the problems he caused. Uh, I saw some of that in Canada in the 70s, yeah. where evangelists would come to churches and they would, crowds would come for the miracles, the signs and wonders, but they destroyed uh, the, those ministries. One in San Jose, California, one of the greatest churches in the country. Uh, they had a revival, supposedly called revival. And uh, when it came to an end, the people of the church did not come back. And the whole ministry shut down. 
And, uh, but where you see the scriptures ministered with such power, you see longevity. And if they deny the importance of scripture and they focus more on signs and wonders and miracles, which we all need, of course, it seems that in, in our experience, I've seen it at, in Canada, at Evangel Temple, they would have healing evangelists continually, most of whom died early, living in sin, so sad. But the churches that seem to have longevity uh, are people that don't have a whole lot of healing evangelists show up to their churches. I've, I've, I've talked to so many of them that were not uh, uh, charismatics. Uh, you know, Charles Stanley was my friend. And Charles Stanley knew the Holy Spirit yeah. in a beautiful way. And he touched our lives. And so many people, uh, Jack Graham in, in Texas, I spent a whole day with him in the Holy Land. And he asked me about the Holy Spirit till one, one in the morning. And that man today is blessing the whole nation. And he's Southern Baptist. Why is it that in the Pentecostal circles we've had so many tragedies? Especially with healing preachers. What is it? The thing, <clears throat> I remember that when my pastor first told me he wanted to teach me to pray, <clears throat> the thing he said to me, first of all, he said, now tomorrow night, when you come back, he said, I want you to remember, I want you to memorize the scripture. And he said, this is going to be the mantra of what we're going to be all about. Second Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. My pastor was a powerful word man. He was German. He had a great mind. He had a great spirit. He, he had the ability to take the word of God and to communicate it unlike anybody else I've ever met. But here's the thing about it though. If you don't have a word saturation in your church, the spirit of the Holy Spirit in that church is gonna languish also. Many churches try to have the demonstration of the spirit and minimize the word, but it don't work. It just doesn't work. And you know, I've looked at that scripture a lot of times in, in Chronicles where it says, if my people, there's a contingency there, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the deal. That's not a simple message. That is a very difficult scripture. Because the older I get, the more I realize people have a devil of a time humbling themselves. And you know, when God made man, he made him out of dust. He made him out of dirt. And the word dirt, the word humility comes from the word dirt, humus. So when God made the angels, he didn't make any of them out of dirt. <clears throat> when God made the archangels, the seraphs, the cherubims, when God made all the heavenly beings, they're all, and I don't think Satan has the ability to repent because even angels won't repent. Even angels, you know, they, you know, in the, and when God was delivering Israel, he said, watch out for that angel because he won't forgive you. In other words, they were made a certain way to do certain things. But when God wanted a family, he made man out of dirt so he'd have the ability to humble himself and to repent. And so angels don't have that ability, but he made humans, if, if I'm gonna have fellowship with you, I'm giving you the ability, I'm making you out of dirt so that you can humble yourself and come back up to my level. So the one thing that's being shielded from, preach, from preaching today is you have a lot of preachers that's preaching these powerful so-called messages but when they get through preaching, they dismiss everybody and there's no humility. Nobody has an opportunity to humble themselves and to receive that word. And when you take humility out, you're taking the workings of the Holy Spirit out. Amen. So many of our churches now are amounting to, and I don't say this critically, I just say it because my heart's broken. 
Many of our churches now are running full of people. People's not the issue. We herd them in, we herd them out. Get the next group in, herd them out. We've got plenty of people. But there's no moving of the Holy Spirit. There's no speaking in tongues. There's no interpretation of tongues. There's no signs and wonders. There's no miracles. And there's no altar calls anymore. There's no place given to people to repent. So what good is it to hear these powerful things, but you don't give people a chance to repent? Mm. So we need both. Amen. We need both. You gotta have the spirit and the word. Can the I word. ask you a question? Sure. <laughs> you, you weren't expecting that, but we're family and yeah. the whole world is now listening to our talk. <laughs> it feels very intimate. Yeah. But, and, and I'm not saying this because he is Michael, my son-in-law, frankly, my son, I don't even see him as my son-in-law. What is it about you? Wait, 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 wait. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I make know. it clear. I'm gonna make it clear. Ask Jess. No, no, I, I don't I, know. What is it, what, how did it begin when you came on This Is Your Day 10 years ago or more, yeah. when the Lord visited you powerfully yeah, in years. California. 13 years ago. 13 years ago. Yeah. You sat on that set, and I could not keep, keep the tears back, if you remember. You had a visitation from the Lord, and I'm sitting there listening to you in amazement because I saw the amazing change in your life at that moment. And I've always wanted to ask you this. We've talked about it a lot, but I just want to kind of get right to the point. Something happened to you at that time that launched you, and we, we all see the results now, and the, and, and the, and the process of the Word of God got so, like last night, became so profound and so right on and so to the point. I never, I, I'm not saying this just to impress anyone. I have never heard a message on the cross as powerfully as last night. In all the years I, I've been in, in the ministry, I have never heard anything. And it's not just because it's him. I'm sitting there like in shock. Not because of what he said. It's how it penetrated my soul. It just went right through me. And I, I, was, I was so moved. And by the time you said how the Holy Spirit was moving, I was already gone. <laughs> Spiritually, I was in a different place. And so was Ben, and so was Jesse. And, and Raul, I think you were there too with us. And, and it's, it's been a process. It's been a, from glory to glory and so on. And I think that's the second time where when we were still living in Cali. And by the way, I want to add we're not leaving Orlando. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. <laughs> totally. I had to say that. Uh, even though Jesus 24 will be in California, it means nothing. This is home. This is home. Yeah. Are you, are you, are you all happy about it? Yeah. Good. All right. I just had to add that. But, but <laughs> when, 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 you, when, when, you, when you preached for me the first time at the studio, I'm sitting next to Jessica, and I looked at her, and I said, Jesse, he's got it. And it was very moving, a very moving evening for me. And now you've come to a much higher place. Please tell us all, what happened back then, 13 years ago, that started all this? Well, you know the answer. 
Pardon? You know the answer better than anybody. I, I know the answer, but the, the world needs to hear the answer. You guys want to hear the answer? Okay, they want to hear. Because I think it puts it all together. It brings everything we're talking about together. That because the Word of God took hold of you. It took hold of you in a massive way. And I was close enough to see it all. And now the whole world is seeing it. Please. Well, it's the mercy of God. I mean, I think if you asked me 10 years ago, I probably would have pointed more to what I was doing. The longer I walk with the Lord and serve him and his people, I'm more aware of his mercy, his keeping, his invitation, his uh, drawing, his love being poured out upon us first, and then us responding in love. But he began to come my way, and I, I couldn't say no. I guess I could have, but there became a point where his feelings became much more real to me. I don't know how else to say that. His desire to be with me started to really penetrate me. So rather than getting up to pray, I, the language changed between him and I. It, it, it was more like, can you come be with me? And so those early mornings in the beginning were tough, as Pastor John said. You're, there is this physical response that is not so glamorous. But somewhere along the line, he, he became my food. And, uh, you, you know, he'd tell me how he felt about things that I didn't really care about. And then I began to discover that Jesus was looking for friends and that he wanted to open his heart, his joys, and his pain to somebody. And I wanted to be that guy. I didn't want him to go to the next door if he were to knock. I wanted him to know that if he knocked on that door, that little apartment in Aliso Viejo, that this heart's door would open. And I wanted to, for him to know that he could talk to me and that many mornings I I didn't know what to give him. I, I was too tired to offer him words, so I began to discover that he just wanted me. And so I would just be there. And I'd sit there with my Bible and wait. And I remember some of those precious conversations. I remember telling him, I'm too tired to talk, I'm too tired to sing. I might even fall asleep, but, but here I am. And his presence became life to me and true bread. And I would open the scripture and I never read this. I still have never, I don't, maybe occasionally on a day I need to minister, but I don't read the scriptures to preach. I read the scriptures to live. And I, his, the scriptures are the Lord's heart on paper. They are alive, and, 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 and just to add to so, so, so many powerful statements tonight, but to add to the breath aspect, I, there is an experience of that, because Jesus said, my words are spirit, and they are life. So I began to discover this wasn't about content. When I would read the scriptures in the attitude of prayer, I could feel the nourishment of the Lord. I could feel true divine life. And it became my addiction, my food, my delight. And I, I didn't even know, I, I figured I'd preach one day, but it wasn't even about that. It was, uh, I'd wake up with him, I would drive around with him, I would walk with him. A at night, I, I, I learned that if I could give him my attention, before I would fall asleep. Actually, Bill Johnson used to talk about that, to just 
posture your heart right before falling asleep. I began to do that and he would give me dreams and visions in the night and it became absolutely glorious. And then at one point, something shifted. When I met the sisters, so everything changed. When I met them in your green room, Sister Rebecca was there. I, 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 don't, I don't know how to say this, but I think, I know this house will get it. It wasn't about people anymore, as Pastor John mentioned. It was about Jesus. So as happy as I was when people would get touched, at that time I began preaching a bit. The meetings were small. People would come forward to get saved. But prior to meeting the sisters, it was all about the harvest. It was about getting people saved. When Jesus became real to me, it became about the Lord of the harvest. And every altar call was an offering to Jesus. And I, I, I discovered my motives had been touched in his fire when I was with him. He had purified my motives. They weren't, they weren't about people anymore. It wasn't humanistic, though we should love people, but we love people best when we're most in love with Jesus. So when people would come to get saved or get healed, I, I, would, I would take a moment and say, Lord, very quietly in my spirit, this is for you. This is for you. I've come to be with you. And, and you taught me this so well, better than anybody. And then, I guess he, well, I guess he started to trust me a little more and he would come more consistently. And my time in private would flow into this abiding life, like in the car, and I, I could sense him. And, and that's where grieving him became my greatest nightmare and pleasing him became my greatest joy. But something happened three years ago where the way I saw Jesus changed because I began to see him with more intensity through the scripture as, as the crucified and risen Lord. Which is the only way to unlock the scripture. So the Bible makes no sense outside the lens of the death, burial, and resurrection. So if, if, you, if you had glasses that let's say you couldn't read the text, the glasses that unlock the text would be cruciform. They would be cross-shaped. It is the crucified Lord that unlocks the word. And it is the crucified Lord who is the very definition of God. So this pressing of self, this declaration of self that's flooding our generation, even in the church, is satanic because it is an offense to the very definition and revelation of God, who is the one who comes to lay his life down. This is the Christian life. And I think, uh, Bob, what happened was, uh, Luke 24 is an example. And this is really, I, I don't, the last thing I wanna do is give a, a pastoring session with Pastor Benny, uh, Brother Yoon, and John Kilpatrick here. This, we've been meeting on Sunday mornings here for two and a half years, so I have a lot to learn. But the way I, this is the way I see pastoring. We all walk in with a limited or severe blindness. We can't see him. We're blinded by the world. We're blinded by its passions. We're blinded by the thorns that choke us. We're blinded by the deceitfulness of riches or fame, which what Francis touched on so beautifully, which was self-promotion and its danger. We're blinded by all that. We're blinded by the haze of worldliness, the filth of the flesh, so it blinds us. Jesus is about opening the eyes of his disciples. That's the whole point of Emmaus. It is these disciples who cannot see him, though he's there with them, 
And they're coming to Emmaus or Emmaus, which is the hot spring, the bubbling up place, speaking of the work of the Spirit. And then he, he wants to open their eyes to see him. That's the job of every Christian leader. Open the eyes by the Spirit of the people who need to behold the Lord. How does the Lord do it? Two ways. Number one, he opens the scriptures to them. And those scriptures are what we call, and, I, and I'm not saying we shouldn't use the phrase, but I do think the phrase brings a limitation. Those scriptures are from what we call the Old Testament. But Jesus did not call them the Old Testament. The apostles, the fathers of the church, did not call them the Old Testament. They called them the scriptures. So in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus died for our sins according to the he was buried according to the he was raised again according to the which scriptures the old testament so jesus takes the old testament and he says ah you're blind you're blind if you see me everything will change everything changes when you see jesus last night i don't know how to explain it i felt like i was an inch away i don't know how to explain it he was so close then what does the lord do he how does he walk them through the garden of the scripture? Where does he start? What does he say? Ought not the Christ to have what? Suffered. Suffered and then enter his glory. Where did Jesus start? Calvary. It's not the end of the story. It's the only way to understand the story. Step one is what Dean Becker said. You die. So how does Jesus unlock the text? He takes you straight to Calvary. Entering into his glory, death, burial, resurrection, the passion. That's how you begin to see. The next thing Jesus does is he takes the bread and breaks it. At the moment of the breaking of bread, they see him rightly. This is the glory of the table. This is why the early church and the didache, or what you'd say in English, the didac or the didache, the early church fed the sheep with the scriptures, worship, prayer, the body and blood of Jesus. And this was the daily feeding of the church. So Jesus breaks the bread, they recognize him immediately, and then he disappears. Why did he disappear? Because he wanted them to learn how to behold him in the areas that he began to show himself to them in the scriptures, in Holy Communion. So to answer your question, uh, uh, Pastor Benny, what happened was Jesus came in mercy. And I don't know why. I, I don't think any of us do. I was telling him today, I got saved right there. Right there. I, I got healed right where the cross is. As a little boy. And here I am today, sitting with heroes, 10 feet from where Jesus came into my life. As much as I can say, I began to read the Bible. I read the Bible because he invited me. And he was too beautiful to resist. That, that's the best answer I can give you. I think you summed it all up beautifully. Yeah. And if I just say one thing and then want to give it back to you, but I'm watching Benny's face my Benny's face, while you were talking. I'm watching you. He's amazing, all of us. Pastor John, that young man here is 15 years old. The depth that he's walking in now is remarkable. Has a great future because of the hunger you have for the Lord in your life. And I think it'd be great tonight if you would, so many young people here that I believe would be touched deeply and their hunger would grow for the Lord. Uh, Benny, you mind just coming up here? Please? Can, can I just put this away?
now you're 15 years old, you're my grandson. <laughs> what, how did it start with you being so hungry for the depth of scripture? Don't look at me, brother. Don't look at me. I mean, he goes, what am I doing up here? You, you, you read, you read Josephus and you read the early fathers and you, you are brilliant with church history and you know, you want to know the Lord and you, you, you want to learn more and you're wearing this cross here with Greek Orthodox, you know, <laughs> just for, for okay, one I mean, minute, for two minutes, tell them because th these young people, all of them, there's mostly young people here. How, how, how do you begin? What, what, what did you do? How, why? Well, I mean, I really like grew up around Christ Christianity, so I really needed like reason for my faith. I didn't want to blindly follow it at all. Can it you got, hear him? Okay. My faith got challenged a lot, and you know, I've grown up, I mean, as much as like PK can get. I mean, my entire I family. You're staring a hole through my head. Yeah, okay, well, who else? Just I'll look stare that at. way, you're freaking out. Okay. <laughs> he's like, he's looking straight into my eyes. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, just tell them. I, I, mean, I know the story. Yeah. I grew up, I mean, around every part of my family was pastors, so I really needed like a reason to follow my faith, and it got challenged a lot, so really recently, Last year, I really started studying it, and I just fell in love with it. It was, it's really great studying it. I enjoy it so much. But you were, you were, you were challenged. You were challenged with young people at school who didn't believe like you do, and you told them the facts. Oh, uh, well. Um, oh my God. No, nah, I just. Why am I? Stop that, that, that okay, well, I needed a reason. I like, I don't want to say I blindly followed faith, but I based it all off of the miracles, which was fine. Then in a school that's, you know, like it was, it's an art school, so they, the kids try to like be like really intelligent and they'll question everything. I really needed a reason. I needed like a philosophy behind it of why I followed this. So I first got into Athanasius and I started reading that because it had a lot of questions about the incarnation that I just, I just couldn't answer. Like someone would bring up like how, like why is Jesus so humble? Like he's always like acting like a prophet. How in the world is he God? So I needed reason to answer that. And that just got me into, I mean, everything. I mean, it, it's, it's like a chain reaction. It was crazy. So I just, you know, I'm happy Tell it happened. About communion. Uh, You can tell them your theology on communion. Oh, uh, like. well, I, I really like side with like the early church on communion. So it's a good place to side with, yeah. don't you think, Dean? <laughs> so it, a lot of people say it's like symbolic. I just, I just don't agree with it. I know it's not the exact church to say that at, but uh, this is fine. I mean, I, 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 I just don't, I just can't see, I mean, to take it lightly and, you know, such repercussions for it to be a symbol is crazy. I mean, it's just, I just can't, I can't. What did he say? He goes, this is Protestant. I shouldn't be sharing that. <laughs> You're fine. Well, You're fine. Yeah. We believe the scripture. We, yeah. But yeah. I, I truly believe now the young people, can, can we get Joel up here and yeah. the people back, please, the musicians. So uh, I think tonight we heard some amazing, beautiful, beautiful facts f about why we believe what we believe. <laughs> yes, yeah. We, we want Pastor John we want you to pray over the young people tonight. And many of them want God to use them. I'm looking at their faces, you know, like glued in. How many are here are under the age of 25? Wow. Should, can I call them? Yeah, why not? If you're under the age of 25, I want you to gently, no running, 
No, 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 I see you up there. That's not a word of knowledge. Come forward gently. The Lord will be here. And we're going to ask Pastor John to pray that the Lord would raise up faithful disciples of the Lord Jesus. Look at all of them. Brother Yoon, would you and Pastor John pray? I'll have Pastor John pray first, and then Brother Yoon will pray a blessing over this young gen- Look at all of them. I didn't know our church was only <laughs> under the age of 25. <laughs> wow. And, and if you want to lay hands on them, absolutely. I don't know how long you can, we can all stay, but let, let God lead you. Pastor, do you have a mic? Let's receive all of us. Even if you're older than the age of 25, you can receive in your seat. Why have you prayed? Pray first. So I'll have you interpret, then I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in holy fear and in holy hunger. Lord, we hear your word this afternoon. We welcome a big hunger in our spirit, in our heart, a longing for your precious word. Lord, we declare the apostles today, Jacob, Paul, Peter, for today, for generation, come out and take your calling and walk the Lord closely and preach the gospel until the Lord could call you back home. Lord, I pray for all the sisters here, give you them a pure heart to see I am your servant, Lord. I hold your word in my heart. Let your will, let your will be done. Let your kingdom come through my life. Lord, here we are. We bow down before you. We see we want to follow you. We want to live a holy life in your holy world. We want to preach your gospel in the rest of our life. Lord, I ask you, please call Daniel, call Paul, Call Isaiah and for this generation to serve your heart for this generation. Heavenly Father, ask you, call the Esther for today, and Deborah for today to yeah. find, and the Miriam to re- release new songs and new melody into the heavenly realm. Yeah. Yeah. 
而且被你的圣灵每一天被你的圣灵充满。Lord, this is a new generation. The Billy Graham for today, Yung Kee Cho for today, Ron Habonka for today. Call them unto your throne and equip them to preach the gospel. 主耶稣，你是被杀的羔羊，无旬节的圣灵，在这五十天之内，在这些年轻人的里面开始烧遍整个美国，火火火，圣灵的火燃烧住这个时代。Lord, in the coming fifty days, we ask you the fire, the fire, the fire of the Holy Spirit, the holy fire of the living Word, start to burning. In all these young people who are standing before your throne, I want to call upon Jesus to bring these young people to their knees and to be the disciples of Jesus Christ. Let the fire of the Holy Spirit again reignite the fires of the Holy Spirit. Let the fire of the Holy Spirit again reignite the fires of the Holy Spirit. Let the fire of the Holy Spirit again reignite the fires of And the prophet, and the teacher, and the preaching the gospel, and the may the Lord use you. May the Lord use you to to conquer the enemy in this nation, United States of America, and go to go to the nations and to welcome the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I want to release the hunger I receive from you to read, to memorizing, to memorizing. To memorize your word in my spirit, in my heart, and release this、uh, very hunger into these young people. 我好想从你们身上看见一个荣耀的复兴，一个荣耀的浪潮，好像海啸一样。Right now, I see in my spirit the big wave of revival is coming through you, through your hunger. And through your surrender to the Lord. 我更看见这一群年轻人将来是一个取代，好像大卫一样，他们今天要被恩膏，他们将来要成为这个职场上，无论在政治的领域，无论在每一个领域之中，主啊，让这群年轻人带领这个时代往前走，把天国带到美国，把天国。Lord, please use these young people to be the leaders of this generation and to bring the gospel into the countries of Buddha, into the countries of Islam, in the countries of Hindu, and into the country of a communist. To welcome your glory under in the nations. 年轻人，我要奉耶稣的名差遣你们，要在最不可能的、最艰难、最黑暗的地方建立神的教会，阴间的权势没有任何势力可以胜过你们。耶稣从死里复活了。Young people, hold on to Jesus. Walk closely with your Savior and bring that precious gospel of the kingdom. To the nations, conquer the enemy, and conquer the thing,、uh, conquer the, conquer the darkness, and to bring the glory of God. If you are willing to follow Jesus, all the young people now come up to the Lord, come to the Lord, and again bring the life to the Lord as fuel. I want to invite you, all young people, go down, go down on your knees before God, and surrender your life as a living sacrifice. And again to the Lord. Amen. You pray. Come on, just worship the Lord, kids. Come on, just talk to the Lord. Worship the Lord. Come on, lift your voice. Lift your voice. Let God touch you. 
Young people, I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please. If you will, stand with me just for a moment. I want to talk to you for a minute, and then I want you to lay hands on people beside you, in front of you, back of you. I want you to pray for one another in just a minute. But listen, what God has done here at Jesus' image is one of the most pure things I've ever seen. And your leader, Brother Michael and Sister Jessica, and Brother Benny, these are pure people. And there's no doubt about it, the devil is going to come and he's going to try his best to attack your leaders and to attract, attack Jesus' image. But I have prayed for you tonight. And I stretch my hand out over you in Jesus' name. And I plead the blood of Jesus to keep Jesus' image and for the glory of God and the presence of God to be more real here than it's ever been. I speak increase of the glory of God in this place. And we speak that every weapon that the devil is forming against Pastor Michael and Sister Jessica and Brother Benny and this school, we bind it in the name of Jesus and we speak, Lord, that the glory of God would find a residence here in a way that it hasn't before. Let it increase. Let there be a great increase of the glory of God in this house. I want you to turn to lay hands on someone by, right beside you, right behind you, in front of you, and I want us to pray one for another. Come on, I want you to pray for each other right now in Jesus' name. Just begin to pray for one another. Lay hands on each other. <coughs>
Blessed be your name, Lord. Empower the young people, Lord. Every one of them calling upon your name. Don't let one of them weaken in the faith. Don't let one of them walk away. Keep them as the apple of the eye. Hide them under the shadow of your wings from the wicked that will try to oppress them from their deadly enemies. And today we ask you, Lord, to cover them in the blood of your son, Jesus. The blessed Holy Spirit, guide them, lead them, bring them into the depth of scripture, into the knowledge of Jesus, the son of almighty God that each one of them will become a mighty vessel of the kingdom of God, that they'll preach the gospel to the nations. In Jesus' name, before you come, before you return, Lord, we all cry, come, Lord Jesus. But before you come, use them to bring multitudes to the cross. In Jesus' name, let them fulfill their destiny in you. Let not one of them miss it. Not one of them will miss their destiny in Jesus. Blessed Holy Spirit, we commit them to you. We commit them to your care and your keeping. In Jesus' mighty name, we give you the praise for what you're doing now. All the glory belongs to you, Jesus. All the praise belongs to you, Jesus. All the majesty belongs to you, Lord. Give you all the praise. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and thank him for what he'll do in your life and through your life. Touching the nations audibly, thank him. Audibly say, Lord, thank you, you're going to use me. Thank you. And I promise to glorify you and follow you all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life and you'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever in Jesus mighty name I want you all to say surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever Amen Let's, let's give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. I want to just, uh, I want to say a few words about Jesus School. So, you that are not a part of Jesus School, if God is speaking to you, it's the best school to go to. Because I believe this is where you find your destiny. This is where you find the call of God for your life. How many of you young people, and Michael and I are amazed at how many young people are all over this building here. How many of you believe God has called you to the ministry? Put your hands way up high. Then Jesus School is for you. And if I can just say also, I'm sure men are watching online who attend Jesus School online, there's nothing like being there physically even though online is fine but being present here the atmosphere changes lives and it's very hard for the atmosphere sometimes to come through your tv or phone or this or that because of distractions that are around you but when you're with the young people with the students you're in that beautiful protection in that atmosphere that is just right for you so I'd really recommend you think about it and pray about it. Now, Lord, bless them and keep them as the apple of the eye. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and give you peace for the rest of your days. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's all yours. Love you. Carla, you still here? Yeah. Can we thank the Lord for all he's done tonight? I also want to thank, can we also thank Brother Yoon and Isaac?
with his new jacket. He looks amazing in his new jacket. Can we thank Pastor Benny as well, please? Also, uh, Pastor John Kilpatrick, what an honor. And Dean, Dean Becker, what a wonderful word Dean Becker shared. Yeah. Are you going to pray for Brother Ian? That's what he wants, so let's all stretch our hands towards him. Uh, dear, dear Brother John, if he's still here, would you come and lay hands with me on Brother Yoon? And uh, Brother Yoon, what do you want God to do for you? What do you want for you? Hordom I'm praying for a bigger hunger for the Word of God and to preach the Word of God. Next year, Father will preach the gospel uh, since 50 years. 50 years next year. Next year, yeah. Me too. Same time. Huh? It'll be 50 years for you and me. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah, is right. Maybe, maybe I'll come to China one day. Amen. Amen. <laughs> when, when he hugs, he really, you can just, he grabs you, huh? Yeah. Okay, we, we're going to pray for you now. For the hunger that you will receive a hunger for the word you've never known, okay? Stretch your hands, guys. Father, in Jesus' name, grant his request that the word of Christ dwell richly within this man of God. Let your word saturate his soul. Let your word bring him into depth he's never known. Let him experience the fountain of life through your word, Lord. May he walk in the depth of the butter of the word, the richness of your word, and may he know it. May he know the depth of it. And blessed Holy Spirit, reveal to him the very depth of God himself through Scripture. Wherever he goes, your light and the light of your word will shine through his life. Keep him safe. Keep him strong. Order his steps in the mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for his witness. I pray that you'll exalt your holy name and glorify your matchless name through this vessel of the kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a mighty hand. Isaac. All right. He goes to the worst parts of Isaac is a, a, a great man of God. And would you pray for Isaac? Today? He goes what now? All over uh, the dangerous, closed nations preaching the gospel. Oh, dear Lord. Pardon? Myanmar. Really? And, um, and Pastor Benny. I never studied English, and uh, I, I want the Lord bless me with a skill, with the ab ability to speak. I, I also never studied German, but I translate for Father in the last 20 years. And uh, I started to translate for Father 2000, I don't know. 21, yeah, because Pastor Michael told me I should do this. So, let's let's pray for him. Stretch your hands towards him. 
Isaac, Lord my God, thank you for this life. Thank you for Isaac, your servant. Thank you for protecting him and keeping him. And now, Lord, I pray you will keep protecting him and keep him. Let your light shine through him. And when he goes to those places of deep darkness, let your light surround him, Lord. Let the light of the gospel shine through him, Lord. Let your glory be seen in his life and through his life. That everywhere he goes, they'll see you in him. They'll hear your voice through him. Yes, Lord. I pray your angels will be with him and surround him. And I pray everywhere he goes, darkness will flee before him. In the mighty name of Jesus, when he goes to those deep places of darkness, let your mighty light shine. In Jesus' name, Lord, great light, I pray, will come through him. When you walked into Galilee, you fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy. Your light shone in a dark place 2,000 years ago, Lord. But you said to us, you are the light of the world. Let him be a mighty vessel of light in Jesus' name. And no darkness will ever overcome him in Jesus' name. For your glory and honor, let your light shine through him. Give me the praise. God's people said, Amen. I saw, I, I, uh, I saw the light of God on you. I know you go to these dark places of the world. You're, 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 you're going to come to a gate now spiritually. There's, there's a door opening, but that gate is uh, shut. It's shut right now. It is closed. That door is a nation that is closed right now. There's a lot of darkness behind the gate, I see. But the light of God is about to break it through. And get ready for it to happen. And God is opening that way for you now. Now, I believe we are going to see amazing nations opening up to the gospel that have not opened in the past. And I, and, and I see you in parts of Africa. So be ready for parts of Africa. But what is coming, and I didn't know the Lord would show me all this as I'm talking to you, there's, there's, there's coming a great change in 2024, about the end of 2024. A great change is coming to the world. I don't know what it is. All I know is there's a great change coming spiritually, spiritually. And, and it would swing doors open after that, after that, because the, the, the whole globe will shake with the judgments that are coming upon it. There's great judgments coming to the world that the world is not prepared for. And by, by the end of 2024, they, they, they're going to begin and the, and the world will be shaken by some of the things that will happen. But at the same time, that's when the doors will swing open. The nations that have been closed will swing open because they would not know what to do, where to run. God Almighty is going to use, you'll be one of them used at that time, so get ready. And dear brother Yoon, I believe the Lord's gonna do some amazing things with you. In fact, I'm, I'm hearing the word of the Lord for you. Out of your innermost being will flow fire. Out of your innermost being will flow fire. 
when you speak, the fire of God will come through your being. Your words will be fiery words in those days. The Lord has kept you here and alive. You have not, you, you are not able to be stopped. You are not able to be stopped. They try to stop you. They try to kill the, the destiny God has put through and in you, but they failed. Satan's plan was destroyed for this moment, for this moment. And you came into this world for this moment, for this moment. 2024 is a key year prophetically, very key prophetically. The whole world will be shaken by what will happen to this world. And it begins at the end of 2024. But God will shine through you with fire, not just light, fire that will consume the works of Satan everywhere you go. And the church in China will keep growing. No devils in hell will stop that. <laughs> Brother Yoon. I was invited by the Chinese government back in the 90s to go to China, and I went to Beijing. I have pictures to prove it. They invited Paul Crouch, Pat Robertson, and myself. And I went there after Pat had gone, after Paul had gone to China. And I met with many of the officials in Beijing. I went to Nanjing and Shanghai. And I will never forget, one of the officials told me that Christianity would die in China. He was mocking us. He said, Christianity would die in China. He said, they believe in healings and miracles and such a thing will not survive. And I took with me some of the top preachers of the day and I hit the table. I, 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 I got in a holy anger hit me. And I smacked the table, I said, I said, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail and neither will you. That's what I said to him. I looked at his face and I said, Jesus said, the, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail, neither will you prevail. I said, the meeting is over and we all walked out. But God Almighty has kept you alive to reach the church in China. You have an assignment, brother. I may never go to China. I want to. I want to. To preach, I mean. They would not let me. I asked them a permission. I met with the head of the religious department there. I said, why don't you let me come preach here if you have freedom? And they claimed that they had freedom. And he said, no, no. He said, you can preach in our churches, but not in stadiums. I said, why don't you allow a homecoming? A homecoming. He had never heard the word. I said, homecoming. He said, what? I said, well, bring all the churches in one place. That's a homecoming. And he kind of began laughing. He thought it was a nice idea. But they would not let me preach in a, in a stadium. But the day is coming. China will open up as never before. Come on, let's give the Lord a mighty shout. Shalom. <laughs> Love you all. I said, you can dismiss him. He said, okay, whatever. <laughs> now, listen, listen. As you walk out again, because Christmas is next week. So as we walk out, can we sing? Oh, come all you faithful. Is that all right? We did last night. So can we do it again? Okay, come on. Oh, come all ye faithful. Joyful and triumphant, O come ye, O come ye to bed. You can start going if you want. Thank you. <laughs> Singing. Come and behold him, born the King of Age. O come, let us adore him. O come. There you are. Come on, please help me. Allison, all yours.
keep going. We believe that the nations will descend on this land. That the sick will be healed here. That the lost will be saved here. That the presence of the glory of God will rest here. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. That the mountains might shake at your presence. That the gospel will go forth from here. Shaking the earth for the glory of God. That the presence of Jesus Christ would dwell among us. Here we will enter into the peace of your presence. Here we will remain. Jesus said, remain in me and I in you. Here we will remain. This is holy ground. Where only one thing is needed, Jesus. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May he be adored and worshiped here. May his word be taught in clarity and love here as we tell the generations to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works He has done. May the generations come to find Him here. To find Jesus here. Here. Together we will build the house of God. And a home for His people.